Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Mark McEnroy. I teach here in the theology department at the University of St. Thomas. And together with Dr. Tim Paul, my colleague in philosophy, we are delighted to welcome Dr. William Abraham to speak to us today. Dr. Abraham is the uh, Albert Cook Outler Professor of Wesley Studies at the Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. He earned his Bachelor of Arts from the Queen's University of Belfast in philosophy and psychology. He then attended Asbury Theological Seminary, earning an MDiv in 1973. Uh, and he went on to earn his doctorate from Regent's Park College in Oxford in 1977. He was awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree from Asbury in 2008. He is the author of an enviable, enviably long list of books. I will uh, mention some of the titles to you right now, but they, uh, they go far beyond what I will mention. Uh, in, the, in 1985, he wrote an introduction to the philosophy of religion. He's also written uh, The Logic of Evangelism, Divine Revelation and the Limits of Historical Criticism. And more recently, he has uh, co-edited the Oxford Handbook of Methodist Studies. Uh, Aldersgate and Athens, John Wesley and the Foundations of Christian Belief. And uh, in this year, 2014, he has just published Shaking Hands with the, De the Devil, the Intersection of uh, Terrorism and Theology, which of course will have quite a bit, I am sure, to do with his talk for us today, which is titled Terrorism, Forgiveness, and Justice. I think those of uh, uh, us who have had exposure to Dr. Abraham have been struck not only by his extraordinary generosity of spirit, but the remarkable way in which he manages uh, an extraordinary breadth of interests that does not sacrifice depth for that breadth. Truly an extraordinary feat for an academic. Um, before we get underway, I should mention we are thankful uh, to the Center for Philosophy of Religion at the University of Notre Dame who has funded a seminar that has brought Dr. Abraham to speak to us today. Thanks also to my colleague Tim Paul in philosophy uh, with whom I have collaborated uh, to, to bring him here. So please do join me in welcoming Dr. William Abraham. Well, it's a great pleasure to leave the low living and high thinking of Dallas, Texas and come up to the high living and low thinking of St. Thomas. <clears throat> I am thrilled to see so many students here. Um, and I trust that what I have to say will be sufficiently provocative that it will keep you alive over the next 45 minutes or so and then for the questions afterwards. The topic I want to take up is a very powerful topic in the sense that uh, I was brought up in a world of terrorism. And it took me to uh, get to the United States to get enough distance from it to deal with it. And uh, I've decided that at this stage in life, the job of the professor is to profess. <laughs> and so I'm going to deal with certain objections, maybe en route to the position that I adopt. But I'm looking forward to a lively interaction and discussion when I finish my remarks. Uh, I want to begin with two actually very interesting case studies having to do with the relationship between terrorism and forgiveness. <laughs> Um, there should be a handout. I think there's enough handouts to go around where I've got some of the quotations. And the first involves a member of my own church back in Darling Street in Enniskillen in the Methodist Church there. And involves a remarkable man whom I knew growing up as Mr. Wilson. Now what happened was that on November the 8th in 1987, he and his daughter were actually uh, on a Sunday morning waiting on a remembrance parade that was taking place in the town. And out of nowhere, uh, there was an explosion and a wall um, collapsed and 11 people died. And one of the persons who died was actually Mary, who was the daughter of Gordon Wilson. I read about it and then I saw it on television and I'll never forget uh, what he said after he'd gone through this horrendous experience when his daughter died. Uh, he said, essentially, after the quotation you've got here, which uh, I just draw to your attention, he said, basically, on, on television, uh, for everybody to hear, I want no dirty talk. Now, what he meant by that is he didn't want any talk of revenge. He didn't want any talk of retaliation. He wanted to deal with this in what he considered to be a serious and Christian way. Uh, he was actually appointed a senator in Dublin. For those of you who know Irish politics, that's quite, a, quite an honor. 
And uh, at a certain point, he actually was involved in uh, negotiations with the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, and uh, had been a terrific leader in terms of those who wanted to develop uh, conversation, negotiations, try to bring this terrorist campaign to an end. Uh, and eventually, he simply said, uh, br briefly, what he basically said was, uh, I've gotten nowhere. And in fact, all that I'd hoped for in terms of conversation didn't take place. But what stands out in his case, what stands out in the case of Gordon Wilson, is the extraordinary magnanimous spirit that he showed after having been through this horrendous experience of losing his own daughter through a terrorist attack. But the second case is a, a very interesting case and has to do with an Episcopalian uh, priest who um, lost a daughter, her name is the Reverend Julie Nicholson, in the bombing in London in 2006. Now, in this case, I do want to read um, the, the passage that I've got here on the handout. And it runs like this. Um, I rage, she says, that a human being could choose to take another human life. I rage that someone should do this in the name of God. I find that utterly offensive. We have a lot of things causing certain people offense. And I would say that I'm hugely offended that someone should take my daughter in the name of religion or a God. I have a certain amount of pity, the fact that four young men felt that this was something they had to do. But I certainly don't have any sense of compassion. Can I forgive them for what they did? This is where it really cuts deep. No, I cannot. And I don't wish to. I said in the early weeks, and until still now, I say the name of my daughter's murderer. Every day, she says. And I believe that there are some things in life which are unforgivable by the human spirit. It's an extraordinary claim. We are all faced with the choice that those four young human beings, four human beings on that day chose to do what they did, and they chose to do what they did. I leave potential forgiveness for whatever is after life. I leave that in God's hands. I take Jenny with me every inch of the way. So although physically her body is gone from this world, the essence of her is very much with me in this world. And as long as I have life, then the spirit of Jenny will have life. Forgiving another human being for violating your child is almost beyond human capability. All my understanding of what it means to be a priest is peace, reconciliation, and forgiveness. It's very difficult for me to stand behind an altar and celebrate the Eucharistic communion and lead people in words of peace and reconciliation and forgiveness when I feel very far from that myself. So if someone were to say to me that my ability to forgive Jenny's killers would end the violence, I could probably find the courage to do it. I have really, really struggled. I've always been in awe and humbled by those who stand up and say, from a faith perspective, I forgive. I read more books on forgiveness in the months after Jenny died than I've ever done. A lot of imagery I work with is of Mary at the foot of the cross, and forgiveness doesn't come into it at all. If Jenny had survived, however awful her injuries, and had said, Mommy, I forgive them, then I would have had to do so as well. But she didn't. Now, I bring these two dramatic cases before you because I think if we're going to deal seriously with terrorism and forgiveness, we need to heal the force of what's at stake for those who are close at hand. I mean, in many ordinary circumstances, forgiveness is not a big deal. Uh, I was traveling through Munich uh, a couple of weeks ago, stuck at the airport for eight hours, and, you know, and got out my, you know, the things you put over your ears, I don't know what you call them, and got the music going, you know, and nobody else could hear a thing. But I started, you know, after a while, I was, uh, you know, going along. I hear he couldn't sit still. And this German came over and he poked me in the arm. <laughs> you know, told me, stop doing it. He was trying to sleep. And I said, I am so sorry. You know, please forgive me. And, you know, he said, oh, it's not a problem. No problem. Now, those are situations where, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to get your underwear in a twist. You don't want to relax. You want to let it go. But these are cases. These are cases where the issue of forgiveness 
takes on a depth and a resonance and a kind of sort of moral and set of theological dimensions that seem to me to be absolutely crucial. Now, if you follow up on the stories of Gordon Wilson and Julie Nicholson, they went through a living hell. And even though they uh, wanted to bring peace into the world, both of them very much so, uh, the world had been extraordinarily brutal towards them. And in Gordon's case, of course, he, he didn't want any dirty talk, as he called it. He didn't want anybody to use this and And in a certain sense, indirectly, I think, he was uh, committed to the condition of, of forgiveness. The case of Nicholson, Julie Nicholson, of course, is, is much more uh, sort of demanding. And uh, one of the things you've got to think through immediately, we have admiration, as, as actually Julie Nicholson says, we have admiration for the likes of I have for Gordon Wilson. And that admiration is what you might call a kind of truth-detecting mechanism. So the, why do we admire such people? Because we actually see something that's good there. Now, if you look at the Nicholson case, what you have is a different set of emotions. It's revenge. It's a sense of resentment. It's anger at what's happened. And I want to just say in passing, it's very important that we not ignore what's going on here. Because, in fact, what, what's going on is the detection of what's evil and what's wrong. Now, there are deep philosophical issues underneath the surface here in terms of moral psychology, in terms of what human beings are as cognitive agents. So that your visceral reactions uh, are not simply to be dismissed as just emotional overkill, initially. What, in fact, is going on here, I think, in the reaction of both of these people is that in the case of Nicholson, where you, where you have this really deep sense of anger, if she didn't have a deep sense of anger, then she's not detected. She's not actually discerned the evil, the moral evil that's been done in my judgment. And so we need a whole sort of a careful attention to the moral psychology and the epistemology involved. But the more relevant question for today is the issue of what is it to forgive? And by the way, by terrorism, just to let that get that out of the way, by terrorism, I'm meaning here um, uh, practices and actions where you deliberately cause terror for political purposes. And that requires a lot more conceptual work. But there's all sorts of terrorism that's out there. Uh, you know, drug terrorism, state terrorism, one sort or another. But the, the kind of terrorism that shows up in Ireland in many ways is a kind of political terrorism. And what you do is you quite deliberately injure and harm and kill and cause terror to innocent people in order to achieve political purposes. That's a very important that we think about that. Now, for forgiveness, then I think we ought to have, we've got to think through very carefully as well, what is it to really forgive? And I'm going to cut to the chase here, and I want to say that to forgive as it, at its most basic means two, two things. It means abandoning resentment against those who have harmed us. And then extending pardon <coughs> to those who have done the wrongdoing. In the standard cases, therefore, there is both a subjective and objective dimension to forgiving someone. On the, on, the, on the subjective side, it means letting go of the hurt and the resentment and the anger that naturally arises when somebody does deep harm to on the objective side, it means that we extend pardon and release to those who have wronged us. And in the Christian tradition, by the way, there's a wonderful parable in, in Matthew 18 uh, of the two stewards where the one is forgiven uh, like $100,000 and the other is forgiven about $10. And, and they, <laughs> they, they start on Twitter and they get the guy back in and he's gone forever. He's tortured him <laughs> and whatnot. But in, in there, the analogy on the second part of this is very dramatic. It's like forgiving someone a debt. Now, I suppose I owe you, you know, $100,000, and you write it off. And you release someone. That's part of the analogy that's involved in the side that I think is pardon and forgiveness. It's deep release. So the two crucial dimensions I want to say to forgiveness are precisely the subjective and the objective. And the normal way in which we forgive people is very simple. It's by performative utterance, like, I forgive you. 
In that respect, it's, a, it's like, say, when you get married. And as my existentialist tutor once put it to me, Abraham, you're getting married, and you're going to stand up before another human being. He said, a pink piece of flesh, I brought up in the north of Ireland. And he said, you're going to say two words, I do, and look at the trouble you're going to get into. <laughs> Now, J.L. Austin is a great philosopher who's worked on that, and Searle and others. But actually, to say, I forgive you, is, is, a, is a very, very important performative utterance. It's not just like asking a question or making a statement. It's releasing someone from the wrong that they have done and setting them free, parallel to the way in which you would release people from a debt. So I want to say that in paradigm cases of forgiveness, this is what you get. Now, the immediate and important theological and moral question that arises is forgiveness in the full sense conditional on repentance. Now, we're going to come to this in a certain, uh, I'm going to open up at least a line of objections to my work, but this is a very important question. Does it require that the person to be forgiven acknowledge their wrongdoing, turn away from it, and even make appropriate restitution where possible? Now, my own answer to that immediately is yes. And to be technical, forgiveness is a performative act that is interpersonal and bilateral. That is, it requires actions by both parties. And minimally, in normal cases, the person to be forgiven acknowledges the evil that they've done, and makes that clear, and the person harmed forgives by saying sincerely, I forgive you. So forgiveness is an act conditional on uh, repentance at this point, it is not a mere disposition. To be sure, one can have a forgiving spirit, and that is a readiness to forgive those who harm us. However, forgiveness should not be confused with a forgiving spirit, or even with a more general disposition to love. It involves specific acts of forgiving, dealing with real harm that has been done in radically contingent circumstances. Now, there are, of course, anomalies and hard cases that are out on the edges of this. And uh, what happens if someone has harmed you and they've died and you're not able to actually say, I forgive you to them? Uh, that's where it seems to me the subjective side is uh, what you can deal with. You're not going to be able to do, deal with forgiveness in the full-blooded sense in which I want to, want to propose. But I think it's very important that we don't make anomalous cases, the standard cases. And I think that in the standard cases, Forgiveness is conditional on repentance, and true repentance will re lead to repair, where possible, of the wrongdoing. So suppose, you know, uh, I, I find a student who uh, doesn't like my grade, and they decide to slash my tires. And of course, nobody here would ever think of doing that to any of the esteemed professors that are in our midst. You know, or I, as a professor, decide to give out grades on the basis of, well, whether you've got an Irish name or not, <coughs> which of course would exclude myself, so I'm not being a very good Kantian. Um, it, it, it's clearly the case, if, if you slash my tires, I think it's fair to say that not only should you acknowledge the wrong that you've done, and come and just say, you know, I'm really sorry, I had a bad night, I drank too much Irish coffee that day, or whatever the extenuating circumstances are, but I think it's only appropriate that you maybe make some small contribution to uh, my buying some new tires. And I think that uh, if I give you grades on the basis of whether you've got an Irish name or not, and you go to the dean, and they call, the dean calls me into the office, I think it's appropriate not only I recognize the injustice of what I'm doing, but maybe that I sort of uh, make up for this in other ways, that I forego a final exam, or some other wonderful thing that students like at the end of a semester. <laughs> Now, how far you want to take that, I, I, I'm going to leave open for the moment. But it seems to me what's at stake here is the bilateral character of, of, of forgiveness. And, and that it's what's at stake is, in fact, uh, acknowledging on the part of the wrongdoer that they've done wrong, and insofar as it's possible for them to actually make a difference to repair the damage that's been done. Now, it becomes very interesting uh, to push this further. Is, does forgiveness, which is I'm proposing bilateral, does it require what I'm going to call full sort of reconciliation? Now, what I mean by full reconciliation here is that where the relationship is not only restored, but it's brought back to where it might have been originally. 
Now, I think, in fact, there are circumstances where you can have forgiveness, but where reconciliation in this very robust sense is not possible. And I think it's one of the great merits of uh, the feminist movement that it's drawn attention to cases like this. Where, for example, in cases where women have been abused, and I know examples from my own, just from my own history with students, uh, in cases where they've been abused, I can, I can think of circumstances where, given the abuse, to ask full, for full reconciliation is, in fact, inhuman. But where the appropriate reaction can be one of forgiveness and um, a minimal repair of the relationship in that respect, but not full reconciliation where you go back to, this, to the, where the situation was before. Uh, when I was doing some of the research on, my, on, on, on the work on this, I, I interviewed some folk who were involved. By the way, I, I interviewed uh, what I call a loyalist terrorist. I haven't listened to, haven't listened to the text, but these stories are so good, you've got to hear it. I had a group of students over from, from SMU, and we interviewed uh, uh, a really hard, thuggish terrorist. Uh, 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 he was a Protestant terrorist, right? Uh, and how do I know he was a Protestant terrorist? Because we asked him certain questions. <coughs> So uh, we got to the point where we knew him so well and he was so relaxed, we asked him, did you ever pray? Did you ever talk to God about what you were doing? Now this is a man who was kneecapping Catholics, who was training young men to plant bombs in places where innocent people would be killed, and didn't think twice about it. And he said, yes, he did talk to God about this. Now, of course, he never admitted he was never part of any terrorist organization. You know, he'd never been found guilty by anybody. But he said, I did talk to God to him. I said, well, what did you say to God? He said, I told God that I was going to do what I was going to do. And then that when I was finished, he could do whatever he wanted with me. That's why I call him a Protestant terrorist. That's a Jonathan Edwards, you know, let me be damned for the glory of God, after all. So uh, what, what you can see here is that the... the uh, the issue of how um, the wrongdoer responds is really important at all of this. And what I'm arguing for overall, uh, another interview which I have in mind here, I interviewed a couple, uh, a mother in her 70s who'd lost her son. And in fact, the person who'd done it lived down the road, the farm down the road. And I have no doubt that this woman could very well, easily, and readily forgive. She certainly had a forgiving spirit. I'm sure she had, could forgive the people who did it. The father, interestingly, wanted to meet uh, the individual down the road. And all he wanted to know was how his son died. The mother couldn't handle it. Now, the point I'm getting at here is that you can have forgiveness as a bilateral reality. But to push for full reconciliation is, in some circumstances, to me, morally not acceptable. It's, it's an act of supererogation, to use the language of the classic uh, Catholic tradition. It's a heroic act, which is, you, would, you, would, you would be sort of really impressed with it, but it's not, it seems to me, obligatory. And it seems to me, therefore, we need to make clear distinctions between forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, what about justice? Does forgiveness and even say, if we got as far as reconciliation, does it cancel out justice? Now, those who kill Jenny Nicholson are dead, and they're beyond the reach of earthly justice. And those who kill Mary Wilson, Marie Wilson, Mary Wilson, remain unidentified and free. There were 32 people involved in that terrorist bombing in my hometown. That's a lot of people. Because you have the people who plan it right to the top, you have the people on the ground who organize and work out the route. You have the people who look, who check out the building. Uh, enormous operation to do that. And all, no, none of those people have ever been caught, and none of them have ever been brought to justice to this day. So what do we make of these circumstances? Here I'll sort of just lay out my position again. I think domestic terrorists deserve both the protection and full weight of the criminal justice system. They deserve protection, for naturally some of those who identify with the injured will want to execute revenge by taking the law into their own hands. And that is part of what I think Gordon Wilson was after when he spoke of no dirty talk. So even while being punished for their crimes, terrorists are persons with rights who are not to be used, I want to say, as means to an end. 
they deserve the respect that is due to them as persons. Now, you want to go off into sort of the theological underworld there, I'll go with you. Because I think actually there are very important conceptions of what it is to be a human being made in the image of God and all the rest of it that provides sort of deep ballast to this move. It's very important. However, I want to also say they deserve the full weight of the law in punishment. For such behavior is morally reprehensible and it is rightly outlawed as criminal and published by the state, punished by the state. And here, the state minimally exists to protect the innocent, to um, preserve the peace, and to administer justice. It would be morally bizarre if terrorist killers were given a free ride when, say, thieves, regular, good old, regular, thuggish thieves, or rapists, or everyday killers, were hauled off to prison. The romance that still hangs as a gray halo around the heads of terrorists, maybe they're really just freedom fighters, needs to be scuttled, in my judgment, with gusto at this point. Justice is an equal opportunity practice, and it's not a beanbag where we can choose arbitrarily to, ex to exclude certain kinds of heinous acts. Now, it's often thought that to forgive also requires that the offended party give up all thought of reparation or punishment. I think this, too, is mistaken. Our obligations at this level are very complicated. In cases where, just general cases, where no criminal action is involved, if a person deliberately harms another, I think it's only right that the person make reparations in response morally. So if I deliberately smash up your car, I think I should pay for some of the damages, if not all of them. But notice in this case, where there's no criminal activity, that's between you and the other person who's involved. Now, uh, the, the criminal cases, of course, are quite different. And now I'm going to sort of move into the key move I want to make here, which, uh, which is a, a classical one, but very unpopular in the current situation, where criminal activity is concerned. And the state is brought in to deal with uh, the situation. I think it's different. Just as a person has no right to take the law into their own hands in order to right a wrong done against them, so a person, in my judgment, has no right to waive the requirements of the law when a serious wrong has been done against them. So if someone murders your child, you don't get to decide if the accused murdered or should or should not be arrested and face charges. Those in power sometimes are apt to forget this when they're under pressure to achieve political ends that will be thwarted if the law takes its course. And they can readily reach for the language of forgiveness and reconciliation as a way to cover their spin. And when such discourse is skillfully presented in what I would call quasi-religious settings, it's easy for ordinary people to become confused. But the law rightly takes the issue of justice out of the hands of the offended and of politicians, so that there may be an independent rendering of what is due. Now, to be sure, the agents of the legal system can take into account how things stand between the offender and those offended. But this is a far cry from abandoning what I see as the minimum requirements of justice. Forgiveness, and in the extreme case, personal reconciliation, and justice are radically different concepts. And they stand whole and complete on their own. And to deploy forgiveness to undermine justice is to pave the way, in my judgment, for further evil. Now, justice in these circumstances, and you'll see that I'm getting knee deep now into moral theories related to punishment. <coughs> justice in these circumstances is to be distinguished from therapy and from deterrence. Both therapy and deterrence can be taken into account in the administration of justice. Every effort can and should be made to heal violent agents of their nefarious dispositions and to deter others from imitating their killing sprees. However, terrorists are first and foremost agents rather than patients. They have chosen specific strategies to execute their intentions. They have been even trained at great cost to themselves and others to develop those strategies. Lesser crimes merit lesser punishment. Greater crimes deserve greater punishment. And when the punishment is complete, absent capital punishment, they are then free from state interference. They are once more agents who are to be received back into society. 
And in and through the administration of justice, there's always a place for mercy and for consideration of mitigating circumstances. And that's why justice can never be a simple case of straightforward calculation. It must ultimately be in the hands of judges and juries who can tell, who can take all the relevant factors into consideration. Now, the immediate objection to this that's been made again and again, of course, is that this sounds just like straight old-fashioned revenge. But in fact, there's a crucial distinction, which has been implicit all the way through here. You know, revenge is if you slash my tires, well, I'll go after you. And I'll, you slash one of my tires, and I'll slash two of yours. Right? Uh, re retribution, which is at the core of what's at store, store is not revenge. This is a common mistake that's being made, in my judgment. And you, I'm sure some may want to disagree with this. There is a crucial distinction between paying someone back for harming us and a properly constituted system of law holding wrongdoers responsible for what they've done. And it seems to me either thinking of the uh, proposals on punishment uh, uh, that I've given you as revenge is just simply a category mistake. This is not revenge, it's retribution, which involves justice, where there, the person has to have done something wrong and where there has to be a proper system in which they are brought to court, and there has to be appropriate punishment. I mean, if I steal five apples, should you lock me away for 20 years because it's going to take 20 years to fix me? Whereas if you, know, you're, you, you go out and you do something really heinous, and all we need to do is just give you a good dressing down in the court, you know, just get the judge up with a fancy uniform and look you in the eye and scare the bejeebers out of you, you know, and off you go. This is not what justice is. Justice has a sense of proportion about what's at stake in terms of, it seems to me, the core moral moves. So it's very important to distinguish between justice, as I'm understanding it, uh, which is really a classical vision of retribution here, and revenge, and to distinguish between both of those and retribution, excuse me, and therapy and, um, and, and deterrence. Some of you may want, want, may want to go into this in due course. Now, the other issue I want to pick up in the last couple of minutes is this. How do forgiveness, reconciliation, and justice relate to the transition to normal civilian life? Now, this, of course, is exactly the problem that we face in the world of Iraq. We've had a civil war that's been going on for a long time, very emotional, very, very, very intense. And uh, so what do you do if you've had 30 years of terrorism and counter-terrorist activity on, on, on the part of, of two communities? that can't live together. Now, um, I'll, I'll, I'll walk quickly through this. Two key elements have emerged in this. One is a proposal about forgiveness, and the other is a proposal about restorative justice. And I'm going to just touch on these quickly because they're in the air and they're very important, and I'm sure you've been thinking about these. One distinguished, one distinguished Scottish theologian uh, came over to the north of Ireland and basically took the view, look, in the north of Ireland, speaking to the Protestant community, you've got forgiveness wrong. What the people who've been wrong need to do is to forgive first, <laughs> and maybe that actually will bring about the repentance and change in the persons who've been engaged in this kind of terrorist activity. Now, what, all I want to point out what's going on here is that you're dropping out the condition of acknowledgement and repentance and, in fact, uh, any change. Um, now, I think that's a massive shift, and it's one I'm not prepared to go with. And uh, A, because I think it gets forgiveness wrong in the Christian tradition. It's the standard Christian tradition is that if we confess our sins, God will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I think the Catholic tradition gets it right. Uh, we Protestants are swept the uh, confessional clear. Uh, that, you know, if you're going to deal really with evil, you, you need to come and acknowledge it. And then the appropriate act is we're forgiven. So this is a position that actually eliminates the element of, 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 uh, of acknowledging evil. And the other secondary reason why I'm opposed to this, um, and some of these are dear friends of mine who hold this view, is that I think it puts an added burden on the victims. So what you're saying to the victims is, you're responsible for these people over here 
not actually changing. You need to sort of step up and say, I forgive you out front in the hopes that this is going to fix the situation down the road. And say that to people that they don't even know in some circumstances. Now, I, I just think this is, uh, frankly, I think this is not acceptable. I think these people are carrying enough burdens without this extra sort of super moral burden that we're putting on people vis-a-vis -vis the, the issue of forgiveness in this case. Now, the other, the other issue here uh, is, has to do with the, um, the question of restorative justice. And the way this has come up in the Irish situation is via a remarkable visit to the North of Ireland by Archbishop Tutu winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, one of the extraordinary leaders in the, in the Anglican tradition across the world, amazing character, uh, fascinating man. And he basically came into town and, and wanted to develop the whole issue of restorative justice. And in the end, uh, maybe you put it down to the stubborn sort of Northern Irish, they're, what they're up to, they said no. And you'd say, well, why, why would they do that? Well, here's why. If you actually look at the, if I see it, the South African situation, what you really had was amnesty. Now, amnesty is, exact, amnesty is, is, is a wonderful practice because when you get to a situation where the civic society is collapsing, which is what we've had, where we've had civil war, where normal democratic institutions do not work, um, then it seems to me you've got to deal with massive numbers people who've been involved in terrorist activity, and where you're trying to pull the community out of the dark ages of a certain sort, and get it back to some sort of serious equilibrium in terms of justice and civil society. Now, in actual fact, I think a lot of what goes to the name of, of, of restorative justice is one of two things. One is, and here I, I, and I'm in favor of both of these, it involves, one, doing all you can to help people, for example, who've been terrorists, to stop being terrorists. And that's a massive social problem, for example, parts of East Belfast, where you've had young working class fellas who've been initiated into the whole world of terrorism. And, uh, and when actually you get a measure of peace, where do they turn? They turn to the drug money. So all the, anything we can do to heal the disposition of those who get in East And the other case is the, is, is the parallel with amnesty. And that's pretty much what we've done in the North of Ireland. Uh, we've, what we basically said is, look, we've got to move forward. So we have a completely different democratic system than you get in other parts of the world, in which the majority cannot, if you like, um, shut down the minority. The minority has to agree to all of the public policies that are actually implemented in the north of Ireland. <laughs> it's very, very tricky. It was developed by a Canadian uh, called De Hunt. Very, very complex process of proportional representation and and, uh, you know, in the, the, you have two leaders who are from both sides, and then you work your way through, uh, down into the committees and whatnot. And I think what we've done there, um, we don't call it restorative justice, but what we've really done de facto is amnesty. And uh, so terrorists have been released, and we've given everybody a, a, a chance to start over again, and that allows us to begin to put back in place your normal, what I would call, sort of moral conventions of governing justice and punishment and all that, and uh, hopefully move forward. And just to finish off, I'm right on time here, I think, just to finish off, it's an open question. Uh, hopefully this is going to work. Uh, it's an open question how far this will work in the future. And I can assure you, the enormous amount of work is being done out of Dublin, out of New York, <laughs> out of Brussels, out of London, in the north of Ireland itself, to make sure that we don't go back to the nefarious activity that we've been engaged in uh, for uh, at least in my life in uh, So the bottom line is this. What I'm proposing is this, is that, is that the issue of terrorism raises an, in an acute way the challenge of forgiveness. <laughs> and any treatment of this that simply treats it casually is just not acceptable. And that the forgiveness is fundamentally involves working through the emotional, the proper emotional response to what's happened to us, and genuine pardon, forgiveness, and release. That's the paradigm key. That is entirely compatible, I want to argue, with a robust conception of justice, which should not be confused with either deterrence or therapy. And that the more recent sort of objections to the position that I'm developing 
that have been laid out very powerfully by uh, Scottish theologians and by those committed to restorative justice, either they can be that can be a, either it's wrong, as I think in the case of our Scottish friends, or in fact it can be accommodated uh, under the under the rubric that I give, and particularly under the rubric of amnesty, and and then we can move forward. very much, Dr. Abraham, for that uh, thought-provoking talk. We have some time for questions, and what I would ask you all to do is raise your hand, and I will bring you the microphone so that the whole room can hear the question that is asked. Uh, we have a few minutes here to pose a number of issues to Dr. Abraham. I will uh, invoke executive privilege here, and uh, ask, oh, do, do we have, okay, I will restrain myself, and uh, Perhaps invoke pri that privilege later. <laughs> yeah. No, that's you, John. Uh, this is a clarification question. Is what you're including just that we need to have both mercy and justice in order to forgive someone? Um, that's a good question, actually. Um, I've not I've not expressed it that way. Um, I put it more in terms of having a forgiving spirit having a compassionate spirit, and I think you're right. Maybe we should press that forward to being merciful. Uh, that would capture that even more powerfully than I suggested. Uh, so I will take that as a friendly amendment to my proposal. Uh, he's a very perceptive Professor Abraham, I'm having a bit of a difficult time uh, right here, uh, uh, piecing together two different parts of your lecture. So at one part, you uh, indicated the importance of the Christian tradition's insistence that, um, that uh, God and man can be, can be reconciled. At least that's the way I, I, I understood what you were saying. Full reconciliation is possible with God and man. But you said that that is not possible in certain human-to-human -human cases. Yeah. Now, if human-to-human -human relationships ought to be modeled on God-to-human relationships, where does that leave us, uh, and why did you say that? All right, that's a very good question. That's because I don't have a fully realized eschatology. Um, I think the full reconciliation between human beings and the divine involves ultimately uh, theosis, transformation, and higher sanctification radical transformation of human nature. And um, so in that case, if you've got a robust doctrine of grace, which I would have, I think you can go all the way to the top of it. The problem you're dealing with when you're dealing with civic society uh, is that in actual fact, you're going to have to deal with people who are not going to make any acknowledgement, or if they do, they're not going to radically change. So on the human human side, if, if we were on the other side, please God, and we got in with the luggage, which I'm hoping to be with. Uh, then we've got a ball game that fits your, the, the paradigm that you've identified. But I think you, you cannot simply transfer that naturally to human-human relationship. Um, if, if you don't have a fully realized eschatology, and I don't have a fully realized eschatology, I have strong eschatology that the kingdom is here, and that in the lives of the saints, and in all cases, in many interesting cases, you have exactly what we would want. But that's not the way the world is. And particularly when you deal with civic society, you're going to have to deal with the way the world is. And I think also within the church. Within the church, if you've got, say, situations of abuse, it's only appropriate that the people who are the perpetuators of abuse never be allowed in future to be involved in certain kinds of practices. It's too big a risk. So that's how I, I don't think I'm uh, incoherent. I think it's entirely compatible from within at that point. But that's a wonderful, that's a very sharp way to put it. Yes, Professor Abraham. Uh, first, thank you for a fabulous talk. Um, I have a question about when you spoke about amnesty. Yes. Uh, did you mean that would set conditions for forgiveness if you have an amnesty? Or I'm, so I'm wondering what 
how amnesty is related to a forgiveness? Yeah, that's a very good question. I actually, the amnesty has to do with the issue of what's called restorative justice in the literature. And it, it has to do less, I mean, forgiveness sort of can be part of, I, I, I'm going to sort of separate it off. And I mean, the really interesting case, if you read the material in South Africa on the, on, on the uh, what they did there, uh, as you know, um, Nelson Mandela's wife would not play ball. And Archbishop Tutu did everything in his power to try and get her to play ball. And the issue of amnesty, to make it clearer, is that you set a time, beginning now, running forward to this stage, where if you come forward and publicly acknowledge the harm and the evil that you've done, sometimes in the presence of, not necessarily the victims, but the victim's relatives, we will not allow, that you will be able to walk free from this court, from this, from, from, you'll be able to walk free. Now notice that there is not, I, I think it's a matter of setting, amnesty and restorative justice is a matter of setting aside justice, sharply. And you do it because in fact, at the end of the day, you're in such a mess, politically and in civic society, that if you don't do this, you're just going to have perpetual civil war and perpetual um, uh, evil for the long haul. And it's an effort to try and deal with that. So whether I want to call it forgiveness or not, I would prefer to say, no, you let it, you set aside justice because we're dealing with the public square, we're dealing with the civic order. And then whether, in fact, you, when you get it down to the people who are harmed in a more personal relative way and they're uh, the people who have harmed them, then it's going to be up to them to work through what measure of, if they forgive and, and what measure of reconciliation is going to be possible. That's a very good question. And by the way, if I can say, in the Irish situation, it's just amazing. Uh, I mean, we had a massive relief of, of prisoners. And it wasn't just the prisoners who were released. They were actually given a nice sum of money when they walked out of the, of the jail in order to try and start again. And, uh, and in some cases, this has been a, 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 a tough case in the civic society in Northern Ireland right now, in Ireland, where they were given, given letters that went as high as the courts will go, saying, you will never, ever be prosecuted for what you did. And these were not publicly available until recently. Now, I'll tell you my own view on this. I've been brought up in that world, and still, much as I love Texas, God sent me to Texas because I have a lot of sin. You know, a lot of sin, you get sent to Texas. If you're, if you're more sanctified, you get sent to Minnesota. But, you know, I have friends who are totally opposed to Mussolini. Very, very dear friends. Who I, I, and my own view was no. I, I, I said no. I think I will hold my nose if I may say so. And for the sake of the long-term long future and the establishment of the best democratic, best democratic process that we can get our hands on, I was prepared to say, look, we've had this enough. Let's get over it. Everybody's on board. And if I may say, out of crypto today, George Mitchell, Mitchell Senator George Mitchell, uh, had an incredibly important role in pulling this off. And so too, and I'm not declaring my political underwear here at all, so too did Bill Clinton. Behind the scenes, there were crucial, there were crucial phone calls made at two o'clock in the morning, uh, where you Americans, if I may, may say so, and the moral and, 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 and uh, other clout that you've got had a terrific role in furthering what I myself actually wanted to see happen, and which my friends were, see were some of my friends were seeking to undermine uh, at every possible turn. That answer your question? Sorry, I just had a quick clarification question. Um, at some point you talked about how just as a person has no right to take the law into their own hands to exact justice on somebody, um, there's a similar condition that they don't have the right to like 
not exact fact justice on them? I, would that be a, a case of like, oh, it's not okay to not press charges? Or like, could you clarify what you're saying at, at that point? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. I mean, the, the point I'm making, once you get criminal activity, if it's like more civic stuff, you know, if it's, if it's we're uh, fighting over, you know, some sort of issue that's between me and me and nobody else, right? And there's no criminal activity involved, then you and I can try and sort that out. Or there may be other lawyers can help figure that out, right? But where you've got criminal activity, the point about the classical theories of punishment, as I understand it, then of justice, is precisely to eliminate revenge and then take it over into a sphere where, in fact, you neither have the right to press the charges, someone else has, the prosecutor has to do that, nor do you have the right, in most circumstances, to actually rescind them. Now, the judge may take into account what your attitude is, and that's why I think judgment is so important. That's why I think juries are so important. That's why we need judges. You can't just do a calculation. <clears throat> It'd be nice if you could just sort of run it through the computer and say, here are these six factors, and we'll get the result. No, you need real human being making judgments. And so while I, I want to say that the, on the second half of it, have I a right to uh, not press charges, right? That could be taken into account in the cases that I'm identifying as criminal cases. But I, I think, so there's a slight difference between the two. But in principle, no, I'm not going to let that, I'm not going to let that erode what I think is really important. Excellent question. There's a man in front here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, this is just a couple of comments, I think, maybe, rather than a question. Uh, you and I both know that uh, there's a tradition in Ireland of uh, domestic terrorism going back centuries. And I don't think that the, that tradition allows for either repentance or uh, excuse making or apology making. Uh, it's a culture of uh, martyrdom. And so I think that if victims were waiting for, let's say, IRA terrorists to say they're sorry, they've waited for a very long time indeed. And that, that's one comment. The other is just a, an observation perhaps on what, what you wrote here that my guess is that Gordon Wilson was probably a happier and wholer, W-H-O, yeah. however you spell that, a wholer person than was, the, uh, is this woman the Episcopal priest yeah. because uh, the other aspect, or another aspect of, of what you've been speaking of is, is that what, what takes place within the heart and mind and soul of the person who is forgiving, irrespective of what the, what the, the uh, terrorist or other does to them, that they bring themselves a measure of wholeness and healing uh, that they cannot and will not get as long as they carry around the anger and the hatred. Um. These are wonderfully sensitive comments, and I'm going to make a quick comment. On the second one, I think you and I are on the same page. And uh, it would need to be developed a lot more fully if I was sort of doing a full dress version of this. But I think that the, the poison that sets in if you don't deal with what I've called the subjective side of forgiveness is very deep. And the healing that's needed in the human person at that level, uh, in, uh, comparing Wilson and, and Nicholson, is very obvious. Um, so I think they are, we're together. I'm going to just maybe dissent a little bit from the first part. Uh, a tradition of domestic terrorism that construes what they're doing as a form of martyrdom. Now, I want to know then what's, this seems to be uh, good terrorism. Which is, by the way, exactly what Osama bin Laden says. Good terrorism and bad terrorism. I don't think there's good terrorism of any sort. So I would then reformulate your worry, if I can do that, in a different way. <clears throat> Namely, that there is a tradition in Ireland which goes back to many, many centuries, as you and I know, which has to do with how do you deal with the colonial powers <clears throat> and how do you bring about the liberation of your people. <clears throat> And how do you achieve uh, your, your identity, your national identity as Irish? And that those who operate in that world um, are indeed martyrs. There are people who operate in that world who engage in acts of violence, let's call it that. And I think it would be appropriate to call them martyrs. But 
I think you cross a line. And I'm not then going to give the term martyrdom to those who cross this line. I'm very uneasy about doing that, let's put it this way. That those who kill innocent people systematically and intentionally for political purposes, and we can argue about whether this is how far this is political or not, but maybe metapolitical. Um, those who do that, I'm, want, I'm going to say no to that. I think, I think we need to keep, for me, it's a matter of keep our moral bearings at that point. <laughs> and so the case you brought up, I think, is, a, is a, I want to re-describe it. And what I don't want to do, put it another way, is I don't want, particularly in the current circumstances, which is what I'm interested in, right? Um, I don't want those who engage either as loyalists or as Irish nationalists in acts of terrorism, as I've described it. I don't want to give them the moral cover of the martyrdom option in order to get off the hook for what they've done. So I'm trying to get a kind of as far into your position as possible. And I know they will not accept the description that I give. But that then becomes the issue at point, the point of issue. And this is where I disagree with my good friend, say, Stanley Horowitz. Um, and this is not to you, but just a, a comment on this. My, uh, Stanley Harwas up at Duke, who's a thoroughgoing, interesting moral theologian. And he says, look, uh, unless you're a pacifist, you know, the IRA, they see themselves as freedom fighters. And that's no different from, you know, there's nothing, you know, that's their description of it. And, it, and if you're a pacifist, you know, we're going to permit that description as much as we're going to commit to, to a description. I think the uh, first thing I want when there's a terrorist attack in my neighborhood is a, is a police. I want somebody with some arms to take care of the innocent who are going to get killed. So what I worry about there, and this is again off the side, is that in fact what you're doing is you're giving terrorists a free lunch on how they describe their activity. And I don't think we should do that. I'm not prepared to do that. And, uh, but that's, you're, you're dead right. I mean, this is where the, the really <coughs> intimate, sort of subtle moves get made, and I want to draw some sharp lines in which I think terrorist acts need to be seen for what they are, which is intrinsically evil. And you cross a line, on my, on my view, you cross a line, and once you cross that line, everything becomes possible. And once you prepare to say, I can kill innocent people, for political ends, you can rob banks, you can ruin people's reputations, you can blow up buildings, you can wreck the economy, the local economy. All of that becomes easy because you've already crossed, it seems to me, a moral line that's very important. That's my view on it, and uh, I've said enough probably to hang myself at this stage. Thank you very much. It's a very good question. So, uh, sorry, I have another question, but yeah. I agree with your distinction between justice as retribution versus justice as revenge. They're distinct, at least theoretically, but in practice, people want to have that retribution. That is the revenge. I mean, they want to fix the past. And, I mean, theologically speaking, they want to have the risen Jesus without the holes in his hand. But we know that's not possible. So, like, is there a practical way when you're dealing with these nations trying to, like, reconcile with terrorists? Is there a way to get past that, get them to see this? Um, I'm not going to give you a premise. <laughs> I'm not going to give you the premise that, that retribution is just another way for the victims to get revenge. <laughs> Although some of them may consider it that. I'm not very really happy with making that move. But your, the second part of your question is a very important one. And uh, I'll, I'll, at least a lot of work. That is, you know, we can sort out the moral taxonomy of what's at stake here. But the bottom line, you've got people who've been very seriously hurt, and you've got others who've hurt people vulnerably, <coughs> and are walking the streets and not saying a word about it. So how do you bring about the spiritual healing and moral sort of repair that's being done on both sides? And listen, um, I'm a Christian, and I'm a churchman. I think the most important institution in the world is the church. And I think it's absolutely pivotal for the church to provide the means of grace 
and the practices in which people can engage these matters and, and move forward in hope and faith and love. I do not expect the state to do that. As I say, I don't expect the state to do my spiritual work for me, and frankly, I'm with you Americans in saying I'm not too sure I want the state to do that work. So I'm not, I mean, I think that's an empirical question as to about how you bring that about. Do you use small groups? Do you use, do you use uh, professionals? Um, uh, are there people who are trained in practices of healing and reconciliation? The Mennonites do this extraordinarily well. Uh, I, want to, I want to bring all, everybody involved in that point, let's bring it on board. But I don't want, I, I'm not, uh, I'm very worried when the state gets too readily involved in that. Why? Because I notice that the state often uses these occasions to avoid the moral dilemmas. <clears throat> and I don't want to avoid the moral dilemmas. Very good question. Back again. Good yes, for you. Another question. Um, it's it's not exactly related, but I was thinking about the issues of like um, more more state terrorism or apartheid or genocide, kind of on a, a higher level than yeah. small faction groups. And I read recently, um, John Kerry told um, the basically said the peace talks in Israel and Palestine are falling apart, and it's it's he used the word apartheid, and people got very very upset about that because yeah. that was such an inflammatory word, and it was so. You know, I, and I guess my question would be, do you think those, those issues of more major state, um, you know, terrorism or wrongdoing, um, do those bring in other questions of forgiveness and, and um, something like that? Do you know what I mean? Could you speak to maybe the issues that you've been speaking about yeah. in relation to those things? You're, you're very astute. That's very astute. Uh, wonderful. I actually want to, I'm going to uh, punt on this. I want to stay tight about the particular range of terrorism that I'm concerned about and then where forgiveness, reconciliation and whatnot fit into that. But I think you're right then. We've got to work through other forms of terrorism, including state terrorism. Uh, or include, say, mafia terrorism. You know, criminal gangs that are terrorizing communities. And uh, that's why I hope that um, people like you, many who've gone at this stage, uh, will take your place in the public order. And having been formed in a serious Christian university um, with great, deep intellectual resources, we'll get into the public order and deal with these issues. Um, and I, I, therefore, will sort of just back off at this stage in terms of, other than acknowledging that, that you've picked up what's very important here, that there may be distinctions along the line here between different kinds of terrorism that require further elaboration, further information and illumination that I'm not prepared to really give at this stage because I, I haven't thought deeply enough about it at that level. And so I'll hand it back to you and uh, become a political scientist or become president of the United States or something else and go for it. This question is related, I think, to some of the questions posed thus far. I'm wondering if there's a way in which the, the subtext to much of, of the reconciliation that, that occurs, much of the forgiveness that occurs, if the subtext in the uh, instances that you're describing isn't a community. And, and uh, I'm wondering what happens, say, when terrorism goes global, right? When uh, the person who uh, injured certain parties isn't going to be rehabilitated, reintegrated into the very community out of which he or she came, but instead is half a world away. Does that present certain challenges in this different kind of setting? Uh, what differences do you see between the, the particular situation uh, in Northern Ireland mm -hmm. and the, the current uh, state of terrorism mm -hmm. in the world today? Well, that's, that's a, very, a very deep question. Um, you can't fix the world. And, um, and good intentions and good moral theory doesn't fix the world, <coughs> number one. Uh, number two, I'm afraid I have a low ball, <coughs> relatively low ball conception of what I think the state should do, <coughs> which is protect the innocent <coughs> and do no harm. And maybe other considerations in there. And um, I think we, 
it's not that I think there shouldn't be maybe utopians in politics and utopian movements mm -hmm. that hold out hope for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe in Murphy's Law, <coughs> which is another version of a broad Augustinian conception of sin. Namely, if things can go wrong, they will go wrong. And what worries me more here on the Burkean, really, if you want to go back into the deep history of Ireland, I think that uh, Burke was right, that the idea that you can fix all of this by good intentions and whatnot is naive. And you, you, you don't know the full consequences of the actions that you perform. <clears throat> so when it comes to, I mean, we, ha we have a residual problem right now of people who never accepted the peace process. And they're never going to accept the peace process. And this, the attitude of the civic government in Dublin, in London, and in Belfast is we are not going to allow these people to wreck what's been done. And that may require um, serious surveillance and ultimately locking them away. Now, maybe this is the end, right? Or maybe there's room for one more question. But this is a murky business. Um, how do you actually bring terrorists to the table? Which is another way of putting your question on the front end. <clears throat> how did they do it in part of the north of Ireland? Now, if you read the current literature, it's basically we all, we, we started believing in peace and reconciliation and behaving ourselves and, you know, let's negotiate and make arrangements. Well, here's another side of the story. The um, IRA was infiltrated to the top by agents. <clears throat> And one of them is called Steak Knife. Or he was called the Nutter, <coughs> which meant that he blew bra people's brains out. He blew their nuts out <coughs> up here. <coughs> and how did, what happened? He was, he was the son of Italian Catholic um, immigrants to the north of Ireland to sell ice cream during the Second World War. His name is Scabatici. And he was beaten up by a group of terrorist thugs, wherever. He went to the police and said, I want to help. They took him, and they trained him, and they put him inside the IRA. Every terrorist organization that I know of has to have a disciplinary group. I mean, suppose Gaffrey joins the terrorist group, and he wants to go to Hawaii for a break. So he robs a local bank in the name of sort of being a good operative. Well, then no terrorist organization can allow that kind of indiscipline. <laughs> the thing will collapse very shortly, especially given the number of people who want to go to Hawaii. So what, what they have is that they have a disciplinary group within, and this guy ultimately was the one who was in charge of the discipline. And in fact, um, when they blew his cover, the IRA could not admit that he was uh, their top disciplinarian, and he's still hiding probably somewhere under a new uh, assumed identity in Europe. <clears throat> now, the, the point I'm getting at here, I, don't, I hope I'm not off your, the range of your question, is that I'm a pessimist when it comes to how far you can fix the world in terms of the civic organizations, no matter how well intentioned, and in terms of government. Uh, and that's why I'm committed to a notion of retribution. I want, to ju I want justice to be done if I do wrong, and I want to be set free. <clears throat> and when it comes to terrorist organizations, the fact of the matter is that given the moral line that they cross, and given the kind of activities that they engage in, and given um, what it would take to defeat them, uh, I think you end up engaging in some very, very apocalyptic activity. I'll put it that way. And uh, I think it was... Uh, finish off this comment, um, I can assure you that the current leadership of the IRA um, did not come to the table because they suddenly woke up one day and said, we're going to have peace. It's because they knew they couldn't win. And that, together with all of these other wonderful uh, things that were going on, including the White House and Brussels, there was an alignment between Brussels, London, Belfast, Dublin and New York. That, that was a kind of like a heavenly alignment that came together and brought the two sides together at that point. But back of that, a lot of other things going on. And we, have, we are not going to eradicate terrorism in the north of Ireland. 
We're going to live with it. We're going to contain it. And at least I, that's crucial to me in terms of uh, uh, what, what, in, what, in fact, we need to think about long term. Please join me in thanking once more. <laughs>